So, um, very okay. warm welcome to all of you who are on board with us today. It's a very special day because um, we've been wanting to bring Obasan to the table for the last few months, but there's been a huge jostle and a bit of a um, competition, should I say, with uh, another uh, Sri Lankan Canadian writer of great repute, Mr. Michael Ondache, who nudged her out in the last popular vote. So we have her now. Um, I'm so exceedingly happy that all of you have made such an effort um, to come here. Most of our regular Bengal club members, about six, seven of them, are away vacationing. I think the last hurrah before uh, they have to come back to work post Durga Puja and pre Diwali. So you are all going to be holding up the fort or the club, so to speak, or Macaulay's residence, so to speak, which this <laughs> club was. <laughs> So um, I'm really happy to see all of you. New faces, quickly, um, Mr. Rafi Jikoy, who is the face of Singapore for all of Singapore. Right now he's in KL, Kuala Lumpur. His wife, Lubu Jumaboy, and I were friends forever for Singapore days. Then we have Dr. Annapurna Palit, who's our distinguished speaker today. We have Dr. Smitha Kotari, my old friend from the University of Toronto, who's done a lot of work um, on related issues of post-colonial uh, fiction. And then we have Dr. Jean Carol Ewart from the University of Florida. It's a warm welcome to all of you. I see uh, Shudodip is here, as I said. Some of our club members are here. Uh, Roma, Dr. Roma Bhattacharya is here. And I am hoping some more will jump in before it's too late. And of course, Shebunti Shen Gupto, uh, our club librarian of um, great fortitude, formidable researcher, and a support. So welcome, everybody. <clears throat> Gurudash, let's go straight into the business and to my PowerPoint. <clears throat> can you see my screen? Um, not yet. I can see Obasan, the Bengal Club, PPT. Yes, we can now, I think. Thank you. So, Joy Kogawa, I met her first in 2001. And what struck me about her is that she spoke as a poet. Her ordinary speech was poetry. And when she recalled her experience as a six-year-old being bundled out of the house uh, with her belongings in bean bags, in garbage bags. It was something I remembered from our experience of going to school with Indian, ah. Indian Chinese Hakka people. And their experience Please put your please put your um, please put your microphones off on mute if if you're not speaking. Gurudash, can we can yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can we just mute everyone for now? Okay. Just a minute, ma'am. Uh, just okay. give me a minute. No worries. So um, to cut a long story short, you know, our Hakka Chinese community in Calcutta 
during the 1962 war that we had in India with um, China, war seems to be enemy number one of the state. So many of my classmates who were Hakka Chinese in Loreto school, uh, run by Irish nuns on Loreto convent in Calcutta, slept with packed suitcases under their pillows. So I totally understood right from the start what Joy was talking about when she spoke about being an enemy and a citizen of the state of Canada at the same time. Later, as we became more familiar with each other, and there was a trust fact, I suppose, there were many stories that she shared. Gurudash, can we have the next slide? So this is a picture that has been preserved. And during World War II, when Kogawa was six, she was born in 1935. This happened in 1941. The Canadian government confiscated her family's home. They were sent to an internment camp like thousands of Canadians of Japanese descent. Next, please. So what I want to share with you, which is probably different from what wonderful explications and insights you're going to get today from the rest of the participants, is the fact that when I was teaching this novel for about eight years running at the University of Toronto in the Can Canadian Studies uh, program, one of the years I met two exchange students from Japan's Waseda University, and they expressed surprise to learn of the Japanese internment through Obasan, the book, but I was totally, totally surprised because I heard for the first time that they had been absolutely uh, taken, uh, you know, by surprise with what they found when they came to Canada because it was such a shameful thing. It was a national shame in Japan. And I think Ritu Gulati will be talking about that in her presentation. And that is why silence in her uh, explication, in her explanations to me, uh, Kogawa maintained that silence is a language for the J Japanese Canadian as well as for her. And she is basically very well known as her very powerful evocative poetry. But then when you read the book, uh, you get a pretty good idea about the fact that she is a poet first and probably a novelist later. Next, please. So to, uh, you know, to hone in on this idea, in 1981, through this distressing story of the protagonist Naomi Nakani, the young girl who grows up, and the persecution of her family by the Canadian government, the conscience of a whole nation was shaken up. The stone bread, because it was so hard and purposely baked so hard by her uncle, which is a, a lead motif, it's, it's a trope through the novel, uh, testimony to the pain and the suffering of an entire community of diasporic Japanese in Canada. Next, please. So this is the historic house in British Columbia, which Joy uh, had lived in. And now she's in her late, late 80s, well, 85, 86 for sure. And I just want you to start with this idea of there is a silence that cannot speak. There is a silence that will not speak. Beneath the grass, the speaking dreams, and beneath the dreams is a sensate scene. The speech that frees comes forth from that amniotic deep. To attend its voice, I can hear it say, is to embrace its absence. But I fail the task. The word is stone. If I could follow the stream down and down to the hidden voice, I 
would I come at last to the free word? I ask the night sky, but the silence is steadfast. There is no reply. She works with this idea of the minimalist Japanese painting or kabuki theater and her content becomes her style. Next, please. So very quickly, shortly after J Japan's entry into World War II, uh, there was mixed emotions within the Canadian administration. Many of the Royal uh, Canadian Mounted Police who are the uh, pretty much the deciders of how uh, law should be manifest and law should be uh, implemented in Canada, remained on the side to say, no, these are our people. But there was obviously political uh, machinations and uh, in order to keep the vote bank alive, and the racist Anglo-Canadian uh, feeling of um, hegemony, agency, power alive, there was the implementation of an internment for the Japanese Canadians. So you can see already Japs keep moving. These were the signs that were put up. These were the Japanese who were unhoused, unheimlich as the word goes and the theory of being unhoused uh, in your own country and then wanting to come back. But where would they come back? Their homes were given away. They were dispossessed. Next, please. So the idea of Freud, of Unheimlich, can be uh, used to read what has happened to these people. And then, of course, in the historical lens, Hayden White and the idea of history as fiction and fiction as history, where the boundaries of what is fiction and what is history is blurred, and which uh, Kogawa uses uh, to her credit very effectively to tell the story of uh, the Japanese Canadian community. Next, please. So this again, the girl with long ringlets who sits in front of Stephen, the brother of Naomi said to him, all the Japanese kids at school, and the word used is Jap, which is a derogatory way of saying Japanese, are going to be sent away, and they're bad, and you are a Jap. So Stephen tells me, am I? Are we? Are we? I ask father. No, father says, we are Canadian. It is a riddle, Stephen tells me. We are both the enemy and not the enemy. So this pretty much sums up uh, the condition of citizens who were treated as enemy. Next, please. So there is an interesting incident where Obasan, which means aunt, so Naomi Nakane's aunt, in her own way, uses subterfuge when the white Canadian government official comes to visit. She said, yes, I'll give you tea. But she pretends not to be able to see, to be partially blind and fills only half a cup for him. So this is the kind of understated metaphor that is used by Kogawa to signpost a very important cultural marker of agency for the Japanese in that very uh, dodgy and challenging circumstance of being a minority. Next, please. So this is Kogawa's uh, words to me uh, quite often that we are such a small group in Canada. It matters to remember, to know who we are. It is important for all groups to tell their stories. And in her opinion, culinary representations are some of the most abiding books on which we hang our identities. Next, please, Gurudash. So very quickly to tell you that in the 
December book club, we're going to include Judy Fong Bates, who will tell you about the Chinese heptarchs, which was just as demoralizing, derisive, and uh, de you know, it, 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 it was so demeaning for the Chinese people uh, that Canada's had a blotched history of immigration. Great country though it is, it is trying to change uh, to multiculturalism, but it is a slow and a hard road. And I think Smitha, Dr. Smitha Kothari will be talking a little about that. She's been in Canada pretty much forever. Uh, when she went, I think she was 16 years old. Next one, please. Yeah, so this is what we're going to discuss uh, in December. I just wanted to leave you with this idea that despite being one of the best states as far as immigration is concerned and the laws of immigration are concerned, it still has a history that is not exactly uh, felicitous as far as being fair to the immigrant. Thank you so much. Um, Gurudash, we are done with the slides, thank you. Now, before I uh, pass the baton on, actually, uh, Dr. Annapurna Palit, you'll have to wait a couple, few minutes because uh, Dr. Jean Carol Ewart, uh, sitting in Florida, has a meeting in a few minutes. So, um, although I would like to share with you uh, a couple of thoughts that Kogawa shared with me, I think I will wait uh, to fill these in. And let's start now with um, Jean Carol Ewart. Go ahead, uh, Jean. Please. Thank you. Thank you. I, I apologize. I, I did not intend to disrupt your whole meeting by no, having to fine. leave for another one. Um, I wanted to say a couple of things about the book, and I will be very quick so you can move on to your speaker, because this is not my field of expertise. Um, one is, I, I'm a U.S. citizen, um, and uh, I was taught U.S. history in high school, and I never learned about the Canadian Japanese citizens. I we were completely ignorant about this. I did not know this until I read the book Obasan in my first year of college. Um, we were told very briefly in my US history class in 11th grade about the internment of American citizens of Japanese descent in the US. There were about 130,000 um, of which two thirds were American citizens never given due process under law interned completely against their constitutional rights, lost their property, Many of them actually sold their property with only a week's notice when they were uh, told by the US government that they would be interned. They thought that they were never, it was gonna be confiscated anyway. They sold it for pennies on the dollar. They lost huge amounts of money and they were never recompensed for that loss until I think that the bill was first voted on in Congress in 1968 and they weren't actually given any money until 1988, um, at which point the maximum they could recover was $20,000. Um, those of you who live on the West Coast know how much that property was probably worth. Um, so it was really atrocious. It was terrible. And I knew very little about it. Um, I, I wanted to share, this is a very quick personal story. Um, my, my grandparents were missionaries. They were Mennonites. Um, they were missionaries in China for a decade prior to World War II. On the day of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, at the same time, the Shanghai Harbor in China was also bombed. Um, they had fled on a boat leaving China the night before. Um, they, in in fact, they saw Japanese vessels steaming into the Shanghai Harbor on their way out. They returned. It was a rather precarious voyage, but they were flying under the Red Cross. Um, they returned to the United States, docked in San Francisco, and my, my grandparents re returned to the Midwest, which was their home. Um, they were American citizens. They spoke German as their first language because they were Mennonites. Um, it took about four generations before the American Mennonites stopped speaking German and started speaking English. Uh, and they also spoke Mandarin, which they'd been speaking for 10 years in China. 
My father records as a 10 year old child being put in public schools in Newton, Kansas and being unmercifully tortured by school children there because he spoke German and an Asian language that they could not identify as not being Japanese. And he was so he's he's a he's a white American child mercilessly tortured. He never talked about it until about the time of his 85th birthday party, when for the first time he shared with us that this had happened to him. Imagine how much worse it must have been for people of that were actually German citizens or actually Japanese citizens living in the United States if this is what happened to a white child who got dumped into a, the fourth grade class in a public school. The atrocities in World War II just went around the board. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. That make, makes us all catch our breath. And I think it's the personal connections, as I said, with the schoolmates that I knew who were Chinese here in India and what they faced, you know, going to those camps in Deolari, it is horrific. And this is not specific. Once again, I think Obasan is important because it's a continuum. It's a discursive continuum. And we see this all the time when a state wants to be hegemonic, wants to be absolute and autocratic. So thank you very much for that, Jean. Always uh, a, a pleasure to have you with us. My pleasure. Uh, if you have to leave at any point, we totally understand. No problem. Thank you. Time. Appreciate it. Welcome. So it's my great pleasure to um, welcome Dr. Annapurna Palit, professor at Deshpandhu College in Kolkata and who has a cache of work with um, Obasan and uh, her doctoral dissertation was on Chinese and Japanese uh, writers and diasporic histories. So uh, she is from, uh, I think it's not wrong to say, uh, Anna, that you have cut your teeth at Jadavpur University and with your supervisor, Dr. Shuchorita Chattopadhyay at uh, the Center for Canadian Studies, well-known powerhouse. Go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Julie Di. I'm so honored to be here today. Uh, I didn't quite know that I was some kind of a distinguished guest. I only knew that I was a participant and I had five minutes to speak on over some. Now, uh, when we think of um, Canada, the uh, immigrant experience, diaspora, the first book which comes to mind, the first image that actually comes to mind uh, is Obasan. It is a historical novel, a political novel, a social novel. It is poised between history and literature. And above all, what I find is that it is a celebration of the human spirit and resilience. Now, uh, Fugawa has created, uh, as you have told us, you know, she has uh, given us uh, what or where history has perhaps failed. Uh, literature has uh, filled up the lacunae. So, what was not learned in uh, history was learned uh, through literature and through. Obasan in particular, because it is the first book on immigrant writing uh, in Canada. Now, uh, indeed, the book is an eye opener, and we come and we come to know about the atrocities that were inflicted on the Japanese uh, people in Canada. There is a plea for justice. There is a she has created an intellect, a site for uh, intellectual debate. And at the same time, she has also uh, given us a very, uh, a, a real picture of the Japanese, uh, Japanese Canadian internment uh, and the Japanese uh, Canadian immigrant experience. Now, uh, what I find uh, interesting, there's so many facets to this book, which are so interesting. Uh, God's plenty here almost. But there are 
two things I'd like to talk about. One is uh, the space that she has created for the marginalized voice. And it is all the more interesting because uh, when we look at the space from where uh, Joy Kogawa herself speaks is uh, itself so marginalized. First of all, she is a Canadian writer, Canadian writer writing in English. In this great corpus of uh, English writing, uh, Canadian writing occupies a small space. Then again, she is a Japanese Canadian, and uh, that also makes her well on the margins. And then again, she's a woman writer, so she herself writes from an. Uh, she writes from a space which is marginalized and she has created a space uh, for the marginalized voice, which is, uh, which is remarkable. And also what I find in this book is that she has uh, given us space for uh, viewing the assertion of uh, uh, the female voice. We have uh, remarkable women characters in this book that remain etched in our minds. Uh, the characters of Obasan, uh, the character of Naomi, and of course, uh, uh, the other aunt, Emily. Now, uh, talking about my own relation with the book, the book is, of course, uh, fundamental to my study. Uh, I did my... Uh, PhD on the Chinese and Japanese immigrant experiences in Canada. And so this book was basic and most fundamental, the starting point for understanding the immigrant uh, experience. And it's interesting because all the more because I couldn't get a copy of the text, which was actually uh, so basic to my study. I started with uh, my supervisor's uh, copy of the text. And uh, then I made a photocopy of it. And for uh, my entire period of study, I relied on my supervisor's uh, copy of the text and the photocopy that I made. I did not have a copy of uh, the text myself. Sad but true. And I searched for it all uh, over, but nowhere could I get hold of a copy of the book. And uh, I actually can't quite remember when I got the Shastri uh, Knowledge Mobilization Grant, whether I had actually uh, given the name of Obasan, but uh, I do remember searching frantically for the book and uh, not being able to get a copy. And then it was only very recently, just before the pandemic, should be around the year 2019 or so, uh, many years after I'd got my uh, degree, when uh, one day I was walking down uh, College Street and uh, interestingly, I was looking for detective novels there. And as I was handling these novels, uh, suddenly I found very innocently perched on a huge pile of books was what? But Obasan, I couldn't believe my eyes. This was a book which I'd been hunting for all the world over. And here, right under my nose, on College Street, is Obasan. I imagine I asked for the price, and I remember being told 100 rupees. Now, 100 rupees for Obasan, the book is priceless. And 100 rupees is, well, nothing compared to what the book is worth. I think I just about managed to grab the book. I think I seized it, put it into my bag, paid him 100. And uh, I can't even remember what happened after that because it was so overwhelming. I uh, imagine I bought a few detective novels after that, but uh, the great mystery came to an end because I managed to find Obasan. Uh, this is my own copy of Obasan, finally proud owner of Obasan, secondhand copy from College Street in Calcutta. All right, I don't know the journey of the book, but uh, it has a remarkable, it is remarkable that this book is now in my hands. Now, uh, coming to the book as such, uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to talk about the three, uh, three women 
that we encounter here. Now, the book begins or was the, the book begins with uh, Naomi visiting uh, Ravin Akule with her uh, Akule, uh, with her uh, uncle, and. Uh, the place is important and the importance of the place is revealed to us also at the end. So there's a mystery holding on, the mystery of her mother's disappearance, which also keeps the book together. And it's only at the end we discover uh, how the mother died. And we also discover why her uncle would bring her to the schoolie uh, every year. Obasan is shown as a pillar of strength. Interestingly, uh, difficult times, challenging times have brought out the best in women, as we see uh, uh, portrayed by the writers of the internment. So Obasan is shown as a pillar of strength. She would prefer to forget the horrors of the internment. She says uh, things like, uh, everybody someday dies. The time of forgetting has come. And uh, she had promised uh, her sister that she would look after uh, the two children, Stephen and Naomi. And so uh, she refuses Aunt Emily's offers to take uh, the children to Toronto and instead looks after them. Uh, her, her love, her generosity, her strength is uh, uh, told, uh, we're told about it all through the book. And uh, interestingly, in the sequel to the book, Itsuka, uh, meaning someday, uh, we are told how Obasan, sick, tired, dying, hands trembling, still could not eat without offering food to others. So uh, uh, the values that she stood for, the Japanese values, the Asian values, the values of a mother, uh, these are emphasized throughout the book, just as the relationship between the uh, Katos and the Nakanes uh, are uh, emphasized throughout the book. And the other uh, woman, the, uh, the uh, Obasan's sister, the other aunt, Aunt uh, Emily, she is uh, a feisty woman. She's an activist. She uh, yeah, it is through her that we come to know about uh, much of the atrocities that were committed on the Japanese. And I'll just read a couple of lines, and this is what she says. They took away the land, the stores, the businesses, the boats, the houses, everything. Broke up our families, told us who we could see, where we could live, what we could do, what time we could leave our houses, censored our letters, exiled us for no crime. They took our livelihood. So it is through the character of uh, Emily that uh, much of the no important notions in the book about racism and marginalization and um, uh, the discrimination and so on are discussed. And the third interesting character, of course, is the protagonist, Naomi herself. Now, she stands for the change uh, that we see in the Japanese people. And she actually says, the past so long, shouldn't we turn the page and move on? So she is representative of the, uh, the Nisei who wrote, who broke the silence of the essay who broke the stony silence and at the same time who uh, wanted to be who wanted to go forth and did not want to hang on to uh, the grudges and the pain and uh, uh, all that came with the internment the, the evacuation and the dispersal which broke up the community almost totally uh, I'd also like to say something about, in this respect, I'd also like to say something about the character of Isamu, uh, the uncle, who shows a gratitude despite everything, despite all the experiences, he uh, shows his gratitude to the hostland, his gratitude to Canada. And he actually says, this is a good country. There is food, there is uh, medicine. Because after all, it is for food that uh, the immigration took place in the first uh, place. Uh, food and a better life, uh, among other things. So the purpose of immigration, if it was to find uh, food and a better life, 
a better life eventually, food, yes, this has been achieved and this is what uh, Isamu tells us. So uh, at one plane, this book is a long wait. Isam, Uncle Isamu dies. And so this is a long wait uh, for uh, the arrival of the brother Stephen and the arrival of Aunt Emily to, um, uh, for the funeral of the uncle. And uh, while uh, Naomi waits, uh, the, uh, she remembers, she looks around the house, she looks around uh, her aunt's house, Obasan's house, and those uh, inner recesses of the consciousness, memory, all that opens up, and uh, the past comes flooding to her. And uh, uh, Kugawa has used markers like food, language, uh, the bric-a-brac in the house, reminding one of uh, home, uh, because uh, these are regular markers of identity. The, uh, the immigrant's identity is always a new identity, not the one left behind, not the one of the hostland, but a new identity, uh, which is created in the hostland. What I like is uh, uh, the dictum. And I'm, and I'm really sorry, but please, can you wrap it up? Yes, We're running a little short of time. Thank yes, you. yes, just now. The resolution comes at the end, as I said, with the translation of Naomi's uh, uh, grandmother's letters, and we come to know the truth. And I'll just end the book, as you said uh, very rightly, she is a poet first. It's so lyrical. The end is so elegiac. I'll just read a couple of lines. Here are the ending lines, uh, which are overwhelming and so elevating. This body of grief is not fit for human habitation. Let there be flesh. The song of mourning is not a lifelong song. Mother, sorry, father, mother, my relatives, my ancestors, we have come to the forest tonight, to the place where all the colors meet, red, yellow, and blue. We have turned and returned to your arms as you turn to the earth and form the forest floor. My loved ones, rest in your world of stone. Around you flows the underground stream. How bright in the darkness, the brooding light. How gentle the colors of rain. And as the book closes, we return to the present. The hope. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anna Palit. An excellent, compelling, comprehensive presentation. And I think as a, as the opening speaker, we have pretty much touched upon all the most important aspects. So without further ado, um, as we do in the book club at the Bingo Club, um, we have three uh, members who are presenting today. So let's get through with Sangeeta, Mrs. Sangeeta Kishlu, Dr. Paramita Mukherjee uh, Malik, and then we'll see if um, Dr. Harish Mehta can be uh, spotted. And then we move on to our wonderful uh, guest participants. Please keep it to three minutes. That's my only admonishment to you. So let's start, Sangeeta, go ahead. Um, can I be heard? Yes, absolutely. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Uh, we have such uh, illustrious people speaking, so I'll keep it really small, uh, short. First of all, this, this entire book was a total shocking revelation of a subject I was even at this age totally unaware of. Um, I mean, to, to learn that Canadians, uh, which you know we always assume that Canada was a free and fair country, uh, could have interned the Japanese like this was really a shocking revelation. Um, uh, Paramita's covered so much. So uh, what, what was fantastic? Annapurna. Sorry, can you hear? Sorry, Annapurna, sorry, I'm saying pardon. Um, apologies, uh, Dr. Uh, um, what was fantastic about the book is the, the resilience, the acceptance, and the stoic, stoic silence of all the Japanese and how uh, sensei, you know, when they were all consigned to Sloka, wherever that uh, camp was, he said, uh, he said, let's be grateful. While we breathe, we, we must have gratitude gratitude that we are together. And 
And this is the tone of the book. They just accept their fate and keep silent. And um, uh, in chapter 15, like in a capsule, she puts the entire uh, mood of the story saying that uh, we are the ham hammers and chisels in the hands of the world and uh, that speak from stone. And, and they are totally rendered, you know, they accept uh, a voiceless surrender. That's it, that's it. Thank you. Well made point, uh, Sangeeta. This is uh, integral to the narrative, integral to the content and the style of the book, the importance of silence as a language and the issue about shame. Very quickly, I want to share with you there was a student in my class, her name is Emily Yamashita. Her parents went to the camp with her two uncles, her mother's two brothers. When they were released from camp and came back, the feeling of shame was so overwhelming that Emily's two uncles committed suicide concurrently. So that was how, you know, that was how terrorizing it was. And especially in the Japanese cultural context, as you point out, uh, Sangeeta, this was a shame that would never leave, never go away. Dr. Paramita Mukherjee Malik, are you here? Another poet? Yes, yes, very much here. Hello, okay. Julie. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you, Annapurna. Annapurna is a great friend. Hello, Annapurna. Um, it Hello. was a lovely to read. And I'll not go into the story. I'll ju just take a minute of yours because Annapurna has really described it so well. I loved the language of the book. Beautiful language, very unique metaphors. Like speech often hides like an animal in storm, like social graces of a common house fly. I just noted it down. So beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful uh, metaphors. And, and the strength of a woman where she says, everywhere the old woman stands as the true and rightful owner of the earth. And such things have really, like I, I, I started admiring her work. And I'll just say one last thing and finish it off. Where she narrates the story of Momotaru's story when she was little, the story was told by her, to her by her grandpa. And I myself, I always think that, you know, how to bring up children in such a way that they are like honest, they are not corrupt. Like in the Indian scenario, I sometimes think that, you know, everybody should be ingrained something into the children so that they, they are honest people. And in Momotaro, where her grandpa says, like, like the end simply, the, the thing you teach a child is honor. So I think when you have honor, you can never do anything wrong. So that really like made me very happy that one big thing that honor, how honor can never make you wrong and your integrity remains in your place. And you know, you know the, the distinction between right and wrong because if you always remember that there is honor, honor of yourself and honor of the other. So that really delighted me, a very nice read. Thank you, Julie, Lee. thank you all. Thank you, Paramita. As always, you have an upswing on a very sad book, but you still bring out positivity. Thank you so much, Paramita. Paramita, incidentally, is a scientist and a prolific, well-known poet uh, in India. Um, I was wondering if uh, Shutopa Banerjee is here. Possibly not. She would have come on then. And I don't see uh, Dr. Harish Mehta. He was on a, a webinar. So let's uh, then move to Mr. Rafiq Chumaboy, who, as I said, um, comes with impeccable provenance. Uh, we've known the couple since Lubu Chumaboy, who was heading many of the organizations in Singapore. And I've always thought of Rafiq as, uh, you know, one of the most erudite, literati, glitterati, Right now, uh, he's he's well known as, <coughs> you know, um, 
recognized as a creative business leader, CEO of the renowned Scots Holdings in Singapore, where he uh, built an enormous empire right now in Kuala Lumpur and is uh, from the University College at Oxford University. And he owns and runs Orkney Investments in Kuala Lumpur. So without further ado, Rafiq, three minutes, let's see what you have to say. Uh, I'm afraid Julie just dumped me in to a group of extremely erudite and capable ladies. So I really feel like the, uh, like the animal surrounded by the lionesses. <laughs> uh, but here goes. I think the first thing that hit me when I read the book <clears throat> was the hybridity in the author. Um, the opening poem said to me that this is not a Japanese woman in the true sense because the focus was on I, and Japanese poetry never is on the I. It's on the larger perspective. So the fact that she personalized it said to me that this is not a Japanese in Japan. So that was the first thing that hit me was the hybridity of, of the writer. That was the first thing. Um, and the other thing that, that hit me, which also, um, uh, Julie, you alerted to, and as the, the, the distinguished uh, Dr. Palit uh, spoke about, is the, is, the, um, is the giving voice to silence, that silence in itself is a language. And that is, again, a highly um, uh, cultural issue. Um, you know, I've had the privilege of spending time in Japan and um, getting to know some very unusual Japanese people. Uh, and the quality of silence uh, is, uh, is, is something that has its own voice in a Japanese context. Uh, and, and I guess the best representation of it is probably in the tea ceremony uh, or in the calligraphy because you can tell the character of a human being so well in his calligraphy. Uh, you know, the quality of the stroke says so much about the person and about their state of mind. And so that's why there is, a, there is that resonance in the silence. So, so that, that was something that I, I saw. I had a sense of like boredom at the beginning because I said, oh my God, she's trying to be an Oran Pamuk in the Museum of Innocence. Uh, this interminable spider that kept crawling across the room. And I said, why, why? This is just so self-indulgent. But it became clear as the book went on that this was her, her way of leading into the metaphors as the stone bread was. So I forgave her that extra 20 pages of describing the spider's uh, nest uh, and I said, okay, I, I'm, I'm prepared to forgive that because of what else came afterwards. So that, there's my little bit of uh, milchi and in, in masala inside there. Um, but I think that what also came across to me was this apparent submissiveness, which is again, a very Japanese trait um, because beneath that there are very, very strong emotions. And I was actually reminded of um, the, 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 that su submissiveness being an, a, a, providing the capability of the coping reaction. So that was the other thing that, that struck me because also when I kind of like go back into the sort of Japanese people that I know and the, and the things that the Japanese did in China, uh, the Japanese have an, a remarkable ability to um, to elevate themselves into the detail so that you forget about the essence. And very much, you know, one of the things that one, I found when I was sort of wandering around in Kyoto, et cetera, was how stylized everything has become to the point where the essence is gone. So you're only focused on the emotion that is being expressed through the action. I, I don't know whether I'm making any sense. But, but that, that, that was the sense that I had even as I read this book. So I think when I looked also at 
the unfairness of what happened. I, I said, look, I can't let this book go since it's Julie who would call me over the coals if I didn't do my homework. So I actually rang up a friend of mine whose family was actually one of the families incarcerated. Um, and he's, I think beyond Sansei, I think he's the fourth generation. Uh, and he was born, you know, just before the, just after the war, I think 46 or 47. And he said, you know, my family never, ever, ever talked about what happened to them, right? And he then said to me that he, his father and his parents came over, not because they were looking for a better life, they came over because they were trying to get away from the Meiji who were so constrictive of free thinking. Um, and the strength actually came from being Catholics. And so this friend of mine is still a Catholic today. And that, and because I could not ever understand how he could be so grateful despite all this that had happened. And he said, it's because of the Catholic church that we were saved. We owned a bank. We owned the largest department store business in, 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 in uh, uh, you know, uh, Western Canada. All of it was taken away. We were left with nothing after the war. But look at where I am today. Uh, he's a very well established, and in fact, uh, one of the top people in, in a major IT company. And he said, look, I had so much to be grateful for and I wouldn't have had it if I had not been Canadian. So, you know, it's, it's, it's converting to great gratefulness what would have been a, a horrifying experience. So, but it also made me realize that we are no different today. The attitudes that we adopt today, if I look at what is happening in your country or my old country, because I actually was born in India, although I'm third generation Singaporean, uh, what is Modi saying to the Naga? What is Modi saying to people in Hyderabad? You are Indian, but you're not Indian. And it's the same story that created the partition. So this prejudice, this um, antagonism, ultimately comes down in my mind to greed. Because what is not said by, uh, by the author is that everything was taken away and given to others. And it's the same thing that's happened in India today. It is the same thing that happened at the time of partition, people were dispossessed. It also brought me back to the fact that, um, of a comment that was made actually in between reading this book, I was listening to a Texas Congresswoman of Indian origin who said, I don't know about all this, all these Chinese guys trying to take over America. They all look the same to me. Now, this was in Congress by an Indian woman who considers herself American. What happens when it turns on her? So, you know, to me, we've not really moved away from this. So, uh, you know, and so the words that, that really so sort of resonated with me were, you know, I am Canadian, but I'm not Canadian. And in many ways, that is, I'm sure, a sentiment that runs across. It's, it's, it's in Britain today, it's in <clears throat> America today, it's in, even in Singapore. So, um, so, so that was the thing, but the coping mechanism is also something else that I had a lot of issues with. And I wanted to just end with this one story of a Japanese friend of mine, um, and just to show the sensitivity of how this thing happened. Now, they, they're a very wealthy family. And I was visiting Japan for the first time with my wife. And I said, I wanted to go to Ryokan, which is a Japanese inn. And so she said, oh, we will organize that. So I said, look, but I, I, I don't want you to pay for it. I said, no, 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 you don't worry about all that. We'll, we'll sort it out later. But, you know, Rafik, since we're going on the train, would you buy lunch for us? There's myself, my husband, my, uh, and, and two of our staff will be coming with me. So could you buy four lunches for us and of course for yourself? And I said, this is a very odd request. No Japanese ever asks you to do this, right? I said, no, because you're staying in the hotel and you, know, you could just get a few uh, uh, bento boxes and it's just so easy to do and it'll save me a bit of organizing. Now, 
they come to pick me up in three cars, one for the staff, one for myself to sit with her and her husband, uh, sorry, her and, uh, and my wife, and the other car just to bring up uh, supplies and bring our bags, et cetera. So this is not a woman who needs me to buy lunch. So I had a very bad feeling when we got on the train that I was not going to be allowed to pay, which was correct. But the interesting thing was this, no husband. So she said to me, um, you know, when we got on the train, uh, she said, I know I'm sorry, uh, um, uh, Katsu can't join us, but he is joining us over there. And it's a, it's a, it's, it's a one and a half day drive. So about halfway through the journey, after we've had lunch, etc., uh, she says to me, Rafik, there's a reason why I actually asked you to, um, uh, well, Katsu is actually, I said, look, this is very strange that Katsu is driving himself and we're going by train. She said, you see, he can't talk to anybody, but he knows that you have a very interest, a very good relationship with your family. He did not speak to his father for 35 years and only met him one week before he died. And he doesn't know how to express his grief. And one of the reasons why we want you to come is that in the, uh, in, the, in the hot water pools, I'm sure he will open up. So please listen to him and see if you can help him. That was the purpose, but you know, it was done in a, and of course they wouldn't let me pay for the, for, for, for the stay. But the point was that it was absolutely subtle as to what was actually needed. The other thing that was very interesting was that it was frog spawning season. And I happened to notice that it was a 16th century crockery that we were given. And that the designs of the way the food was presented was frog spawning season look. I mean, even the, the wasabi was, was a lotus leaf with, with, the, with the salmon eggs on top as being the frog spawn. And the fact that I noticed that change the whole attitude, she said, you see, now you understand why I needed you to be here because you can listen and you can talk to Katsu. And so, you know, to my mind, what comes through in this book is this extreme sensitivity of the Japanese together with this ability to also be the most cruel people in the earth. And it, it, this, this, this schizophrenia, I found absolutely fascinating. So anyway, that's my bit. Thank you, Rafiq. As signature Rafiq Juma boy, you know, you've deconstructed and then you've reconstructed. And I'm waiting to hear Ritu Gulati pick up from your idea of submissiveness, because she too had a Japanese experience and her take on the book should be very interesting. Uh, Ritu Gulati is a museologist. She's an art historian in London and regular at our book clubs. Ritu, go ahead. Okay, as always, I try to limit myself to my three minutes. So I always do a, a writing of what I'm going to say. Otherwise I always get off uh, the track. But I have to say, uh, Mr. Juma Boy gave me goosebumps because it brought back so many absolutely wonderful memories that I have of, and I think all of us have some stories if we even- My, my, my name is Rafiq. I, my name is yes. Rafiq. Sorry. Okay, uh, of the Japanese, because they're, they're such an incredible... Um, anyway, so I'm going to start by reading. So uh, in Kagawa's Obasan, the main theme to me is the emotional struggle between acceptance and non-acceptance, between consent and dissent, and how the various characters deal uh, and cope with the painful and unfair extermination of their identities during the process of internment, uh, in of the of the uh, of the Japanese after the war, which they justified as military necessity. Through the novel, one can uh, one can identify three distinct personalities that deal with this confiscation of their identity, and as Julie mentioned, the Freudian uh, Unheimlich um, in three different ways. The novel can be read as a case study for how different members of society deal with atrocities, bereavement, trauma, and uh, as recently as how 
society has been segregated into these, divided into these three during the COVID pandemic and we have the anti-vaxxers and everybody uh, and the others. Um, and, I, and I also feel Julie has talked about silence as a language. Uh, and as Aunt Emily says, uh, the emotional language and the language of the eyes, a stare is an, uh, an invasion or a reproach. But coming back to the three personalities. So the first personality is that which is represented by Aunt Emily, someone who spends her lifetime vociferously standing up to the authorities and campaigning for a cause, the dissenters. And Emily believes the internment and segregation is like being given, in her words, a pair of crutches while one is striding down the street. She relentlessly lobbies against the silent uh, and subtle undertone of undermining and the unfair alienation and believes that denial is like gangrene. It is, people, it is because of people like Aunt Emily that our society has actually evolved. Um, the second personality is that of Obasan. And she reminds me of my visit to Hiroshima and Nagasaki years ago. And after that, I came to uh, visit my friend and her aging mother, and I was so traumatized by what I saw. And I thought I would spend time just talking about it and listening to what, what she felt. And I was really surprised to see that uh, the, the mother who had survived uh, merely said, everything is fair in war. We just bury what has happened and uh, we don't talk about it which is what Julie and everybody else mentioned, the, just the silence of it, whether it is coping, whether it, with, the, uh, with the memory of it. So much like, uh, she, and Obasan uh, uh, repeats several times in the novel, what is done is done, and everyone, someone dies. And that's repeated and it's peppered throughout the novel. Uh, the third personality is that of Stephen, who emerges towards the end as a successful musician. He believes in moving on and refers to all those consumed with the past and suffering from the memory as myopic crybabies. Perhaps we, we ask ourselves, perhaps he does that, but perhaps because he's now an accomplished musician or is he an accomplished musician because he buries the past uh, and is, a, is that positive spirit. Um, these personalities emerge constantly in all societies and in, 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 every, every, um, in every society and at every time. Um, we need the, um, the Aunt Emilies because they are the ones that bring the change in the society and the change in law. We also need the Stevens. Uh, but Japan does have uh, the Aunt Emilies, and basically it's populated by them. But I'm going to take one minute to share my little um, uh, experience in Japan. So I, when I went to Japan, our friends told us that we're going to be celebrating um, Christmas and we have to spend the weekend at a Bible camp. So we'll drive you for skiing with our children to Nagano. But on the way, we have to spend the night in, a, uh, in, in the uh, Bible camp. Would you mind doing that? And we thought, wow, that'll be such a lovely experience. So uh, we were, of course, not only the non-Japanese, but the in only Indian family uh, not speaking any English. So they got us English Bibles uh, and we spent the day. It was very memorable. And, I, and she, my friend introduced me to all the Japanese who couldn't speak English. So we, we exchanged a few things anyway. After about uh, three, four days, we arrived in Tokyo and uh, the concierge said to me, there's a large parcel that has arrived for you, which is lying in your room. And I was quite surprised that nobody knows me here in Japan. Anyway, opened the, car uh, the, the carton, uh, the parcel, and there was a wedding kimono, a wedding haori, which is what they wear on top. And there was a note that you don't know who I am but I met you at the Bible camp and you won't, I, I don't want, uh, and I was so fascinated by your um, interest and your passion for Japanese culture and art that I would, no one in my family appreciates it and I would like to give it to you. And I still today have goosebumps and I have that uh, kimono. But anyway, uh, off to you. That's my little take on uh, Obasan. I really enjoyed it. Kiritu, as always, uh very inventive talk with your 
both you and Rafiq did that really well, your connects with Japanese culture and Japanese uh, sociological uh, behavior, the way that they react and respond to the outside world. And I think very welcoming, uh, despite what we hear about the stereotypical Japanese being very understated and very cold. That's not, in fact, the case. Uh, it's just the way the culture is. It is just understated. OK, um, let's move on to Dr. Smita Kothari first, uh, University of Toronto, um, and a Jainism scholar who uh, might have a different insight. Three minutes, please. Uh, and then we'll go to Roma and the rest of our speakers. So go ahead. Um, Smita, waiting for you. Dr. Smita Kotari. Hi, Julie. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Am yes. I audible? Yes. Okay. So much has been said about the novel. And as you always well curated, opening, introduced, and all the speakers thus far uh, have given insights, personal and otherwise, of the novel. Thank you, Dr. Annapurna. An Anna play for, yes, Anna Puna, I got that right, for the lovely introduction, a detailed introduction to the novel. Um, I wanna just say that Joy Kagawa in this novel, a Japanese who was interned herself during the World War, uh, speaks to silences that are, that cannot speak and voices the love that is voiceless. The, in, in reading the novel, this is the general feeling I get, whether it's Obasan's and Sam's love for each other, their love for their niece, Naomi and nephew Stephen, Aunt Emily's need to tell the children who are now grown up about the past and their mother's story. It's all told so poignantly throughout, uh, through the narrator, Naomi. It's a first person account. It's, um, I'd say very autobiographical. As Julie has pointed out, the author was six years old, interned in the camp, dispossessed of all their belongings. It is through Naomi's eyes that we get to see the horrible plight of Canadian citizens of Japanese descent, some of whom are third generation um, and, and, you know, like those of us who are assimilated in Canada, who see ourselves as Canadians, they saw themselves as Canadians and perturbed as to being interned. So as, as I was reading, I was thinking about just Saeed's idea of othering people. And I felt, when do we as humans stop othering people? people whose skin, color, creed may not be the same as ours. And we see this, Rafiq has pointed out as of others, we see it all over the world today, whether it's in India or even currently in Canada with our truth and reconciliation with the indigenous people. Um, it's an ongoing process, including, I just, I was shocked yesterday on the news when I heard the BBC, um, anchor saying three people in the Indian province of Uttar Pradesh were arrested yesterday for uh, cheering the Pakistani cricket team. Uh, I, I wrote to a friend, when does, it, when does cheering for a team that is not your own become a crime in a democracy? And her response was, we're not a democracy anymore, Smita. It's a Hindu Rashtra or something to that effect. So this, these sort of incidents keep, keep on, we, we just don't seem to be learning from it. But what Kogawa does as each shift happens, so they move from Vancouver, a lot of them, it, as, as you showed Julie Kogawa's historic home in Vancouver, um, these people, or well-to-do shift to one of the first places they moved to is Slocam in the interior of BC. 
And as she shows each shift of this family uh, of Obasan, Sam's gone, um, you know, Mark is gone. They're in turn in a different place. The grandfather who's a doctor is interned, but in, his, his um, skills are valuable so in a different place. But as they move through the interior, we get um, slow cam seems to become a paradise compared to the brutality of the sugar beet farm in the prairie winters. Uh, it's, it's, um, so I will end there with, with the novel. I think much has been said, but um, just quite by coincidence, we had some friends and neighbors who live in the building who just last Friday had just finished the novel. So it was fresh in my mind. And the, the pair, Art, the husband is third generation Japanese Canadian. I love how we love to say Indo-Canadian, Japanese Canadian, we hyphenate our identities. And so he's as Canadian as you can be. I was shocked to hear as I've known them for nearly six years, really not talked about at this depth. I guess the novel was fresh in my mind. And he said he was born in the camp. He was two years old uh, when they left the camp. His mother never ever, no, nothing was ever spoken about the internment at home ever. Um, he spoke about Joy Kagawa who lives in the neighborhood, whom he met through a friend. And as I started talking about the novel, he says, I think it's Joy's story. And then the wife who is a white Canadian started talking about, oh, her mother-in-law never spoke, but over time as she, you know, was accepted in the family, uh, she sort of coaxed her mother-in-law to talk about this. And without my mentioning sugar beet farms from the novel, she came up with how their life in, on a sugar beet farm in the prairies and how awful it was. And I said, wow, that is just about the same as the sugar beet farms in the novel. Now, interestingly, they were moved from there and they were able to take this house. They could haul it to the next place where they were moved to. So unlike the people in the novel, uh, Obasan and her family in that little room in the middle of the prairies, not heated, except for the, you know, wood stove. These people somehow either owned it and were able to move the house, however way. But anyway, I was, I was quite taken aback by the story. And that this continues, they, nor Art did say that they got some point uh, in the 90s, I think it was, that the Canadian government uh, acknowledged it. And I think they got $20,000, which was what I think Jean said in the US as well. And the whole issue of the indigenous people today uh, about these graves, and now there's a huge, huge thing in front of the Canadian government. I think it's going to be today is the deadline. They're talking about $40,000 per child and it would be at a cost of billions. And I know otherwise normal people would seem like normal people, white Canadians who I've had conversations and then they don't want to as soon as I say yes, but you know, reparations are something, they don't want to talk about it because they see it as these people, I'm quoting, these people who are always whining and we as taxpayers are going to have to pay out of our pocket to recompense these people. So I'll end there. On this target, just on target on. Smitha, and that's really the bottom line. Uh, and no reparation uh, worth its name for the 22,000 Japanese who were rendered homeless, who were pushed to kill themselves, to commit suicide, and 
who have such a huge burden to bear through the generational uh, mode of communication, uh, it, nothing will make up for that. So you're on the money. Agree. Okay, thank you, Smita, for that. Um, Roma, Dr. Roma Bhattacharya, cut her teeth in Oxford University like Rafiq, worked for the United Nations, knows about human rights firsthand. Are you there, Roma? I'm here. Can you hear me, Julie? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, Bengal Club, the few people who are there. And thanks so much, Julie B, for inviting me. Uh, I, I really want to pick up on what Smita was saying about when do we stop othering the other and just start with personal full disclosure. While I've worked for the world and you know been to Japan several times, I'm from Calcutta and on the fringes of Calcutta society, as Julie said, the Chinese live there. And I just ask myself the question and leave that question. They may not be interned in physical camps, but how, what is their status in our society? I just leave that there, full disclosure. Uh, in the meantime, let me get straight to my point in the interests of time. Again, Julie, they, you, there's so much resonance. You talked about silence right from the beginning, and that's what drew my attention to it. But I would like to come to it from the adjective post-colonial silence. Kogawa starts with post-colonial silence. There is a silence that cannot speak. There is a silence that will not speak. Beneath the grass, the speaking dreams, and beneath the dreams is a sensate sea. And as we, somebody's pointed out, speech often hides like an animal in a storm. There is a silence at the heart of the post-colonial experience, a silence of the undocumented, the broken, the shamed, the erased, and the displaced. Ishiguro, Ondache, Kogawa, and others have decided to write the silence into words, into literature. The novel Obasan is a mighty novel about race. It is trauma, displacement, race turned into poetry, and the writing is often timeless. In my given short time, I will focus on the trauma of many layered displacement. First, the connection with the ocean, the geographical, even in the Canadian prairies, uncle searches for the ocean. Grass has become the ocean for the displaced Japanese. This is the closest uncle ever gets to the ocean. In the end, the writer writes, he managed, did he manage to swim full circle back to that other shore? Uncle was a child of the waves. Oceanless prairie land. The Japanese resettled in the middle of nowhere after World War II, but Kogawa does not stop there by comparing uncle to sitting bull. A prior displacement is invoked of indigenous people by the first settlers. Uncle, just hanging in midair, deracinated from the original human context. I quote, he becomes a souvenir of Alberta made in Japan, unquote powerful semiotics in this totemic image. Second, there is cultural displacement, constant clash of Japanese cultural understandings, to quote, to pull with control rather than push with force, enacted mainly by Obasan, the eponymous uh, protagonist, through her silence, her economy of speech. And she, when she does speak, it is always about gratitude. She is a warrior of another kind. She battles to keep her family together, fed, clothed, and more importantly, she becomes the stability, the continuity in the family's ruptured life experiences. To be contrasted with nationalistic anthems in English, storybooks about a little girl called Heidi and, a, and little Stephen's ankles compared to marshmallows, two social imaginaries jostle with each other and one dominates and the other is subjugated. Kobasan is almost like a Japanese sculptor, like a Zen stone, obdurate in the middle of chaos. The language of a grief is silence. And finally, there is the ontological displacement at the level of self and meaning. One way of coping for Kogawa is to write and turn the most horrific and traumatic experiences into a narrative. Naomi's mind is always scurrying for significance. 
She seems unwilling to live with randomness. The unasked question is, what if there were no attempt at a narrative? As Shakespeare wrote in King Lear, that way madness lies. Thank you. Thank you, Roma. As always, on the money with many new, uh, this novel is a diasporic novel and certainly has underpinnings of so much theory that can be related to post-colonialism. So thank you for bringing that out. Uh, appreciate that. Um, okay. Let's see if we can uh, get Rohini. Rohini Chakraborty, are you here? Uh, she's yes, finishing, finishing her MPhil and all uh, the next few scholars are from the MPhil and the MA department in um, Jadavpur University's um, Center for Canadian Studies. And I am so happy uh, that they have joined in. Um, so without further ado, Rohini, go right ahead. Thank you, ma'am. So I'll just begin. Um, so when Professor Mehta invited me to speak on Obasan, I was instantly transformed to my post-graduation classes where my uh, present supervisor, Professor uh, Shujarita Chakrapath, had first introduced us to the novel. At that time, I was an amateur academician discovering the joys of literature. So standing at that point of time, I really enjoyed the writing style of the novel and was surprised by the revolution of history. But today I look at the novel from the point of view of a researcher. So when the initial awe about the masterpiece subsided a bit, I wanted to take a deeper look at the narrative. That is when I discovered Professor Julie B. Mehta's work on the same entitled, The Interned, The Nikutai and The uh, Kokutai, uh, Triply Silenced Japanese in Canada and uh, Japan. It is a well-researched article and looks at Obasan in a new light. For my present research, for my MPhil research, I have dealt with trauma studies and Professor Mehta's article encouraged me to look at the trauma that is um, uh, functioning, that is uh, functional in Obasan throughout. The first thing, thing that strikes me in Kogawa's, uh, uh, that strikes me is Kogawa's own encounter with trauma that leaves her in a difficult state whenever she tries to talk about her mother. To me, this trauma percolates from her mother who was forced to stay in a detention camp after the Pearl Harbor attack. Kogawa's mother's internal and external transformations was a sign of the racism that was prevalent in the nation and probably still prevalent. This tarnished image of an once uh, sophisticated woman haunts Kogawa. And we definitely see this fear throughout the no novel. Naomi's... Um, uh, Naomi's, uh, uh, Naomi's uh, looks up, uh, sorry, Naomi's fears of her own mother, Naomi loses her own mother, and the fear becomes symbolic. The fear of, uh, the fear that Naomi goes through becomes very symbolic, very similar to what Kogawa feels. But what uh, feels like a water, uh, watershed moment for me as a researcher who has been interrogating the trauma studies is Grandma Kato's role. Her initial coping mechanism that is, uh, was silence that is very common in the case of traumatic experiences. When she finds her mutilated, unrecognizable daughter in a state of utter distress, she decides it is best to never talk about it. The pain is never revealed and Naomi is kept in a constant state of mystery about her mother. We are often hesitant to speak about our trauma because we are either ashamed of it or we want to forget it or the traumatic experience often blocks our memories. On top of this, the idea of a national shame was also foreboding and I think that added to the community trauma and resulted in the silencing of a whole generation, a silence that was passed on to the posterior as a veiled shame and inherent sense of guilt. But the real shift happens when we talk about uh, when we talk about trauma, no matter when we talk about it. Talking about trauma does not have a timeline, but talking about it is important. And Grandma Kato finally lets out the silenced trauma. She feels guilty for talking about it, but, then, but nonetheless, she provides answers to Naomi that opens up a road to a reconciliation. So that is my very brief insight on the novel. So it was interesting to look at this novel from this point of view, and it was a learning process for me. So thank you, Professor Mahetha, again, for inviting me to speak on this. Rohini, awesome, awesome. 
nobody else <laughs> has really been able to to get into the trauma aspect so uh, that's a totally new uh, you know a unique way of putting on a pair of new pair of glasses and viewing it thank you so much thank you <laughs> um shuddhadeep i'd love to hear your voice are you there yes ma'am i'm here absolutely Hi. brilliant and i think is going to make a change in the way literature is uh, conceived is conceptualized and is taught one day i hope he will become a a, a great pedagogue go, go right ahead go right ahead thank you thank you ma'am for asking me to join in today and also gratitude to my uh, professor shuchita chattopadhyay who is also present here i can see and i was discussing with her this morning how uh, we lovingly call her obasan at times and how obasan has become a presence in all our lives uh, who even in through her silence can allow us to keep searching for our own selves so on that note i would like to uh, share my response as you had asked me to uh, so joy kagawa i believe wants us to interrogate the real identity of obasan as a cultural signifier in her novel and to know who obasan is one needs to apply the heteroglossic functioning of the female voices in the novel and quite extraordinarily uh, kogawa also posits silence as a voice or as the voice as uh, you have already uh, shown in your presentation ma'am and from here we can also talk about anderson and and, and anderson's uh, muted group theory also now to understand sisterhood critically and by sisterhood i uh, definitely also mean the relationships of the daughter with the mothers in plural kogawa quite effortlessly extends the silence of the stone comparable to uh, morrison's beloved clamor of the kiss uh, to the reader a silence which penetrates the reader's conscience enabling her to understand and acknowledge the unheard or the silent as the silenced and and therefore makes us makes the quality of listening possible in the process in doing so kogawa engenders the literary and political reading of gendered and racialized silences along with the reading uh, of interstitial intimacies present therein few things come up simultaneously during one's interpretation of the obasan identity obasan not only allows one to rethink and reconceptualize the historiography of japanese canadian diaspora but also problematizes the idea of genre and genre making from a gender perspective along with that obasan also takes the creative scholarship on corporeal feminism forward by deconstructing the epistemology of the womb in a way and obviously beyond the anatomical significations in a way and how the reclamation of identity is fostered by a presence of corporeal absence and an inherited silence that is transgressed and subverted through the search of naomi thank you so much so much to talk about shudhadeep i wish we had more time we'll find another platform to do that especially a feminist reading and i was just reading Kerry Sakamoto's latest book um Floating City and there there is you know a constant reference to the womb because the womb of the uh women who were in Nagasaki or Hiroshima at the time have many problematic uh you know effects on the next generation that they produce so that becomes a huge point uh, of interest even in her book uh, which she uh, acknowledges was uh, inspired by kogawa's uh, obasan and that is uh, 100 million hearts i don't know if you've read it but i think it will speak to your uh, thesis very well so uh, if there is no one else then i will call on dr harish mehta our resident historian um and you know always takes the side of the little people his doctoral thesis is on um the people's diplomacy so uh harish if you are here will you please say a few words before we wrap it up and please keep it to 3 minutes thank you thank you very much julie and uh, good evening to everybody uh the no uh, the book obasan and the history of the japanese interred people uh, it intersects with the history of the second world war and the history of racism uh, i think the two are very very closely tied up because during the second world war because of the ferocity of the japanese invasions of uh, parts of southeast asia and then the eventual attack on pearl harbor 
it caused such a uh, backlash in the western world that people of japanese descent were uh, not only uh, singled out for the kind of treatment that we know they were but more importantly from a historical perspective they were subjected to unreasonable forms of racism that went beyond and above and beyond what ought to have been the case because here it was not just the united states and the western world fighting the japanese empire which they were doing very well in the pacific war but they were then coming down on the people who were canadian citizens and american citizens dispossessing them so how does this happen how is it that that the brunt of uh, the uh, ire of the western world should fall so unfairly on these little people and that is because the west has always treated the japanese with a great dose of racism which continues to the day and i'll tell you how that happens so the japanese are subjected to racism uh during the second world war routinely american cartoons and newspapers referred to them as japs japs and apes so it was from japs to apes is very quick uh, uh, so they they were they were shown the japanese were shown as uh swinging from branch to branch all the way from okinawa across the oceans into malaya and then swinging from branch to branch the apes and the japs and the japs landed up in singapore you know so this is how the racist representations took place we can't ignore this and this is how they were singled out for the kind of treatment they were i can't imagine uh, the germans if they were on the wrong side were ever treated the same way dispossession there were large numbers of germans and italians uh, and combatants from austria uh, citizens of austria uh, throughout the two world wars who were not quite singled out in the same way so that's one thing the second thing is the japanese are now part after the war ends they become part of the us world where they become a very staunch and strong american ally the americans have this system called the five eyes which are the five western powers the major powers in a intelligence gathering and other countries uh, new zealand uh, japan has now they want to bring japan into the five eyes as the sixth eye but uh the japanese are being constantly uh, even in the intelligence sharing networks being subjected to racism uh they uh, certain uh, western scholars and western intelligence authorities who write knowledge knowledgeably about the topic of intelligence sharing have still been describing has still been describing uh the japanese race as born spies you know they uh, so this is a fact uh, the, the so this starts with chiang kai shek calling them born spies and this is something that they have latched on to the western world they still think the japanese are born spies and they can't be trusted enough to join as the sixth eye but the japanese will be getting the, that position because of the emergence of china in the present world because china has been occupying such a large space in the american mindset that they have to bring in japan as a sixth eye whether or not they are born spies so this born spy idea is also what uh, uh, you know chiang kai shek called them born spies at the time when the pacific war was taking place so some of the born spies racism plays into the way the canadians japanese and the american japanese were treated they were seen to be as an espionage column that shouldn't be allowed to exist in peace thank you excellent that really unveils this entire mystery of why why should they be treated as the enemy and not the enemy so i i think a, a lot of the stuff which we were struggling with uh, you have brought it into the historical 
theoretical undergirding and I think we have understood the reasons better. Thank you, Harish. Um, Aparna Sanyal, I see you here. Hi, Aparna. Aparna. Hi, Aparna. Would you like to make a Would you like to make a comment? Um, actually, at this point, I didn't get a chance to read the book, but um, I read a little bit of your article and uh, I found it very interesting. Okay. Um, and I'm very happy to have participated for the first time. I was uh, very joyful. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. Thank you. Um, Shebonti, you have the last word, and I want to say a big thank you to Professor Dr. Shuchurita Chattopadhyay who has nurtured a generation of scholars on um, Canadian literature. And I am so proud of her for what she has done. You have, the proof is right there today in front of us, uh, how she has literally created uh, the consciousness about Canadian literature at the Center for Canadian Studies. So Shivanti, you have the last word, my dear, go right ahead. Uh, I think we'll be kicked out in another three minutes. <laughs> go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Uh, to me, the most striking feature of this book is how the author has depicted the triumph of life over death. Although there has been so much of uh, destruction and decay, breaking up of families, but ultimately, the Japanese Canadian as a community could not be obliterated. Um, this, uh, the greatness of the author uh, lies in the fact that how brilliantly and how poignantly she has narrated the story of suffering and ultimately she has shown how the victim has turned into a victor. That is what, that is all that I have to say. Julidi, you are uh, mute. You are mute, Julidi. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Shuchurita, if you are here, would you like to say a couple of words? Since you have been so instrumental in um, mentoring so many of these wonderful scholars we have today. Shuchu, are you here? Ma'am, she has just left. Oh, I think dear. she's left. I think she's just left. Oh, okay. All right. Really very, very grateful. It's been a great discussion. I will send each of one of you the recording. And uh, I, for one, uh, am thrilled. Although we had a very low membership, I think you guys have just, uh, you know, done an awesome job. Thank you so much. Shudhani, Julie, can I, I just say you. one thing? Yes, please. Smitha. OK, so some. I think Shudhani just pointed out uh, brought out beloved so there's a big controversy which i thought you might as a group appreciate in the u.s currently between the right and the left and big protests at school district school board meetings about what the the teaching of critical race theory so again a minority voice being uh, squashed and the novel beloved is the subject of a big controversy in the Virginia um, election right now uh, over how a mom is in an ad done by the right, by the Republican party, talks about how her son, her 17, she fails to mention the 17 year old high school student who was traumatized after reading Morrison's Beloved. And so there's this, uh, I was saying to Shara, as I was listening to the news that poor Toni Morrison must be turning in her grave, that her novel has become a subject of controversy over what high school students should and shouldn't. So there's all this censorship going on by parents, how parents, yeah. and, the Democratic candidate said parents have no business in the school curriculum, which has spawned a big controversy again. Thank you, Smitha. That really I, leads um, us. Is, yeah, that really leads us to how it's still happening. This idea of 
uh, racism, which yes. is, uh, you know, which, which is at the bottom of all the problems that are in the West. Yes. Thank you everyone again, Shivonti, our, our librarian uh, at the Bengal Club, always supportive. And uh, thank you, our techie wizard, uh, Mr. Gurudash Mitro. See you guys again uh, for the next book launch, uh, book club uh, event, which is also a sort of a launch. Singaporean author, uh, award-winning author, Meera Chan's book, um, Sacred Waters. 23rd of November, I'll let each one of you know and send your PDF. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so Good much, Judy. Good night. Bye. Thank you guys are amazing. Good night.